courtesy of the Ancient Word series. Excerpt from Adventure into Inner Earth, The Testament of Olaf Jansen. Get your copy today at Amazon.com, Amazon Kindle, Barnes & Noble's Nook Books, and prepare to be amazed. If you are new to the exploration of the Hollow Earth theory welcome. Like many others, you are awakening to a new perspective and most amazing view of our planet Earth. To aid you on your journey, here is an excerpt taken from the first Book of Enoch, an ancient text, that was removed by the secret rulers of our world and man was encouraged not to read it. Man was led astray into believing that the books of Enoch were satanic and dealt in magic. However, upon reading the first and second books of Enoch for yourself, you will discover it to be a holy book with more in-depth knowledge of the creation of life, our planet, of man and also what was expected of man by his creator. The primary responsibility of man was and is to protect the earth and her inhabitants, to love our creator and to live righteously. The two chapters spotlighted here are of Holy Archangel Michael explaining to Enoch about the place upon the earth that he was just shown. Enjoy. Chapter 8 And those men took me thence, and led me up onto the third heaven, and placed me there, and I looked downwards, and saw the produce of these places, such as has never been known for goodness. And I saw all the sweet flowering trees, and beheld their fruits, which were sweet smelling, and all the foods borne by them bubbling with fragrant exhalation. And in the midst of the trees that of life, in that place whereon the Lord rests, when he goes up into paradise, and this tree is of ineffable goodness and fragrance, and adorned more than every existing thing, and on all sides it is in form gold looking, and vermilion and fire like and covers all, and it has produce from all fruits. Its root is in the garden at the earth's end. And paradise is between corruptibility and incorruptibility. And two springs come out which send forth honey and milk, and their springs send forth oil and wine, and they separate into four parts, and go round with quiet course, and go down into the paradise of Eden, between corruptibility and incorruptibility. And thence they go forth along the earth, and have a revolution to their circle even as other element. And here there is no unfruitful tree, and every place is blessed. And there are three hundred angels very bright, who keep the garden, and with incessant sweet singing, and never silent voices serve the Lord throughout all days and hours. And I said how very sweet is this place, and those men said to me. Chapter 9 This place, O Enoch, is prepared for the righteous, who endure all manner of offense from those that exasperate their souls, who avert their eyes from iniquity, and make righteous judgment, and give bread to the hungering, and cover the naked with clothing and raise up the fallen, and help injured orphans, and who walk without fault before the face of the Lord, and serve him alone, and for them is prepared this place for eternal inheritance. Excerpt from the Diary of Admiral Richard E. Bird, February, March 1947. 09, 10 hours, vast ice and snow below, note coloration of yellowish nature, and disperse in linear pattern. Altering cause for a better examination of this color pattern below, note reddish or purple color also. Circle this area two full turns, and return to assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp, and relay information concerning colorations in the ice and snow below. 09, 15 hours, in the distance is what appears to be mountains. 09, 49 hours, 29 minutes elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains, it is no illusion. They are mountains, and consisting of a small range, that I have never seen before. 09, 55 hours, altitude changed to 2950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 10, 0, 0 hours, we are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range, is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side, are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. 
our navigation instruments are still spinning, the gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 10.05 hours, I alter altitude to 1400 feet, and execute a sharp left, turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn, and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No. It looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yet, there it is. Decrease altitude to 1000 feet, and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed, it is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 10, 30 hours, encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. 11, 30 hours, countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My god. Off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc shaped, and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now, to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11, 35 hours, our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is welcome, Admiral, to Ida Main. We shall land you in exactly 7 minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control, and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 11, 40 hours, another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly, and begins a descent, as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touched down with only a slight jolt. 11, 45 hours, I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance, is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name, to open the cargo door. I comply and log. From this point I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination, and would seem all but madness, if it had not happened. The radioman and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us toward the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of a crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building, that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design board of Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage which tasted like nothing I have ever savoured before. It is delicious. After about 10 minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters, and announce the time to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radioman behind, and we walk a short distance, and enter into what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments, the machine stops, and the door lifts silently upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by rose-colored light, that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. 
over the door, is an inscription, that I cannot read. The great door slides noiselessly open, and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral, you are to have an audience with the Master. We have let you enter here, because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world, I half gasp under my breath. Yes, the Master replies with a smile, you are in the domain of the Ariane, the inner world of the Earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface, and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you, why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. You see, we have never interfered, before in your race's wars, and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power, that is not for man, namely, that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here, that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted, but what does this have to do with me, sir? The Master's eyes seem to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world, rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury, that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms, there will be no safety in your science. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled, and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude, of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour, do you say I am mistaken? No, I answer, it happened once before, the Dark Ages came, and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the Master. The Dark Ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall, but I believe, that some of your race will live through the storm, beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again, to help revive your culture and your race. Perhaps, by then, you will have learned the futility of war and its strife, and after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. End of excerpt. In closing, ponder the following. For Archangel Michael, there is no unfruitful tree in the inner earth. The inner earth was created for the righteous. There are angels, that abide within the inner earth and the light is very bright there. For Admiral Bird the lighting is different in the inner earth. Upon meeting the master of Ariane, Admiral Bird was told that they, the inner earth dwellers were aware of him, and that he was permitted entry, because he was a man of noble character and most importantly, that atomic energy was not intended for man. The four countries, that did not heed the Master's counsel are Japan, the UK, Canada and the USA. Final word, open your mind to the possibilities, do your own research then decide for yourself. In wisdom, peace and love. Be blessed.